the U.S. government warns that Russia could invade Ukraine in just a matter of days. More than 130,000 Russian troops are stationed at Ukraine's borders. That's according to the Associated Press. But the Kremlin maintains it has no intention of attacking. I want to bring in retired Admiral James Fogo to talk about this. He is a retired U.S. Navy admiral, and he's also a dean at the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. Admiral, thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you. Glad and Anne-Marie, great to see you. And thank you very much for allowing me and the Center for Maritime Strategy in Washington, D.C. to talk to you this morning. Yeah, we're grateful for that opportunity, Admiral. Um, so let me ask you about Vladimir Putin. He is continuing to deny that he is planning an invasion. Uh, just strategically, when you look at the situation right now and as the world holds its collective breath to see what Russia will do, are we to imagine that Vladimir Putin, in his attempt to prevent NATO expansion, in his attempt to perhaps reinvigorate the former Soviet Union or some semblance of it, that he would be okay with images of civilians being bombed through an aerial attack by Russian fighter jets? Well, I think that's absolutely right, and that's what's at stake here. Uh, the West, of course, uh, and Ukraine, of course, uh, nobody wants this invasion to happen. It will happen on the orders of one man, and that is President Vladimir Putin, for all of the reasons that uh, you just articulated. First of all, he's never liked NATO, and he wants to weaken the alliance, but he's had exactly the opposite effect. But to take this step is not only going to hurt Vladimir Putin, uh, it's going to hurt the Russian people and the Ukrainian people, and it would be a huge mistake. You know, we just uh, said that uh, President Biden and uh, Ukraine's president agreed to a strategy of diplomacy and deterrence. But, you know, talk of possible sanctions, the threat of sanctions, that hasn't worked so far. We haven't seen Russia scaling back in any way. Um, and so I have to wonder, what are the options that are available to the U.S. moving forward? Biden has already said he's not going to put American troops on the ground in Ukraine. So, you know, Russia already knows that. So what are the... What are the best options should Russia invade Ukraine? Right. Well, Anne-Marie and Vlad, uh, this entire time, we've taken a uh, whole of government approach here in the United States. And uh, people throw out the term dime all the time. And for your uh, audience and your listeners, that's really a combination of diplomacy, uh, information, uh, military activity, and economic uh, activity or economic sanctions. So on the diplomacy front, uh, the president of the United States and uh, his deputies, uh, the Secretary of State Tony Blinken and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan have been energized in uh, diplomatic negotiations with the Russians, with the Ukrainians. You saw President Zelensky and uh, President Putin have talked several times about this. Uh, we have tried to articulate for the Russians that this is not worth the risk. On the informational front, I'm very proud of the U.S. intelligence community for getting inside the Russian OODA loop and releasing information that embarrasses the Russians on that false flag operation that you and other news services uh, covered last week. But that takes away their, uh, their covertness and the element of surprise. On the issue of military activity, we put lots of troops on the ground in surrounding NATO nations. Now, uh, keep in mind, Ukraine is not a member of NATO, so they're not subject to Article 5. An attack on one is an attack on all. But to mitigate the spillover effects of this, thousands of troops have gone to the region, another 3,000 uh, by order of the president going to Poland, Romania, and uh, the Baltic. Uh, there's about 8,500 uh, personnel on uh, PTBO prepared to deploy order. And that number, I don't think, is a ceiling. I think it could actually go up. And then you have the economic aspect of this, and something I call the mother of all economic sanctions. If President Putin orders his forces into Ukraine, those sanctions are going to hurt Russia, they're going to hurt his oligarchs, they're going to hurt him. And you've seen in the last couple of weeks, the Russian stock market has responded accordingly. It's taken a big dive. So all of this combined is to try to prevent and deter the Russians from making that move into Ukraine. And then, Admiral, if none of that works, though, what then should be the role of the U.S. if Russia invades anyway? If none of that works, we need to continue to pressurize uh, the Russians through our alliance in all of the uh, 30 NATO countries, particularly those that uh, surround uh, or are near to Russia and the Ukraine uh, on the eastern flank. Additionally, you've seen 
that uh, lethal weapons have flown into Ukraine uh, in quite a bit in the last couple of months, uh, particularly the Javelin anti-tank missiles, which are very effective against Russian armor. I could see that continuing uh, through a protracted conflict that perhaps uh, becomes a kind of a guerrilla war in the Ukraine, the likes of which we saw in Afghanistan. And I can't believe the Russians do not remember the lessons of Afghanistan, the graveyard of empires where they had to leave uh, in 1989, uh, unsuccessfully. So uh, if this conflict happens, and if it is a protracted conflict in Ukraine and potentially a civil war, then I think that you'll see Western nations wanting to support uh, a Ukrainian insurgency against the Russians. And that means more weapons, and that means more bloodshed throughout the conflict. So, so Admiral, to put a finer point on it, if Russia does attack in the coming days, you don't see it as being something that Vladimir Putin can declare as a victory in just a couple of days or even a couple of weeks. You see the Ukrainians fighting back. You see a protracted sort of, you mentioned, you, you indicated guerrilla warfare, but a quagmire, essentially, where mm -hmm. Russians aren't really gaining any ground. Uh, they're losing men and material, and so are the Ukrainians, but it's not a victory for either side. Well, Vlad, we don't really know how it's going to go on the front. When you're surrounded by 130,000 Russian troops who've got tanks, armor, armored personnel carriers, lots of uh, infantry, uh, short-range ballistic missiles, this will be a combined arms operation. It'll be from the air, from the land, and from the sea. Keep in mind, they've got uh, you know about 30 ships in the Black Sea now. The Caspian Sea fleet, fleet came down to the Sea of Azov right on the other side of Ukraine uh, in that body of water. And so the Ukrainians are surrounded. That first uh, onslaught by the Russians would be probably like a blitzkrieg from World War II. Uh, so they may move very, very quickly. But uh, where do they stop? What's the end game? And that's one thing I'm very curious about here. You know, you remember uh, General Colin Powell, uh, you know, one of the great chairmen of the Joint Chiefs, uh, the late great chairman, he used to have the Powell Doctrine that he would talk about. That is, you never embark upon an operation or warfare without an exit strategy. I don't know what the exit strategy is for the Russians. I don't know if they're gonna go in for the short term or they're gonna to try to make this a long-term regime change. If it's the long-term, I think they've got a protracted fight on their hands and it's gonna it's gonna go on for a long time. There's gonna be a lot of casualties, both on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side. Obviously, we don't want that to happen, which is why our government and all the governments of NATO and the foreign leaders are trying to prevent it from happening through deterrence and dialogue with the Russians. Well, let's hope diplomacy wins the day. Goodness knows everyone's trying. Um, Admiral, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Great to be with you this morning.